plan for the session is each of the four panelists is going <clears> to <throat> talk 10 to 15 minutes about what they see as the, the high points of the, the meeting for them, uh, particularly when it comes to integrating the, the science that we heard about on Tuesday and Wednesday morning uh, with the uh, things that are not to be considered that we heard about yesterday afternoon. And uh, at that, after each of their comments, uh, we'll have a discussion where the panelists uh, ask questions of each other. And uh, depending on how that goes, we will make it to the break. And when we come back from the break, we'll invite questions from people in the audience, including those watching uh, 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 the webcast. We, we've made one change, and that's the uh, program shows of one order of presentation, <clears throat> but we've decided to, to alter that slightly so that uh, Tom will go first, Don second, Paul third, and Chuck will uh, go fourth. All right. So with that, uh, Tom? All, gonna be on base. all right. Uh, thank you all. Uh, this has been a fascinating conference. I have learned more about the science behind this than I ever thought I would know. I am changing profession immediately. I'm going to become an epidemiologist. Um, just a bit of background. I think we, you know, there, is a, there are extensive bios in the materials, but I don't want you to all have to wade through that. Um, some of the opinions I'm going to give today are informed by where I came from. So just as a reminder, uh, I am currently at Dorsey & Whitney. Uh, Minneapolis-based uh, law firm with an office in Washington, D.C. But most of my experience in this area came from my 16 years at the Department of Justice. Uh, through the last half of the George W. Bush administration and the first half of the Barack Obama administration, I was the attorney of justice in charge of the U.S. government's defense of all of EPA's regulations. So that means you have me to thank for Massachusetts versus EPA. That was my greatest loss. Uh, also for the Coalition for Responsible Regulation, UARG case that on greenhouse gases, for all of these ozone and other NAC standards and MAC standards and so forth. But the main point of that is I, I tend to understand how EPA thinks on this and what room they have to maneuver in the face of evidence, and that's what I'm hoping will inform my, my thoughts today, so that you know what you're up against and also how you can respond creatively to it. So let's begin. Uh, what I want to do, and the reason why I'm going to go first, is I want to take us back to what Henry Nickel did for us the first morning and lay out sort of the ground rules in terms of what EPA may and may not consider under the current case law. And as I said, what room it has to maneuver based on what it does receive from the public. So here we go. Um, first of all, just a reminder of the standard that applies to the setting of NACs. They must be set, and we're talking about primary NACs here because EPA has set the secondary at the same level as primary. We're not really going to get too concerned about that today. But the primary NACs has to be set at a level that is requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. And requisite is that key term there, uh, it means neither more nor less stringent than necessary. It is the Goldilocks standard. And that sounds like it might be a very precise test that will yield only one number. It is not, because it is a test that is informed by <coughs> the administrator's judgment. This is a judgment-based standard setting exercise. And that gives the administrator already a lot of leeway. The adequate margin of safety tends to push things towards the more stringent side. So that's the, that's the test. Now, EPA is obligated to set NACs even in the face of scientific uncertainty. They are not allowed simply to throw up their hands and say, you know what, I don't know. The science is all over the place. I can't decide what to do, therefore I'm not going to set an X. Um, despite that rule, 
there must be some evidence to support what EPA is doing in setting an X. Now that has both pros and cons. It means there has to be some substantial evidence behind what they propose to do, but it also means that in the face of a wide array of contradictory evidence, the administrator can still act by picking and choosing which science he or she credits and explaining why he or she does not credit the other science. Now, the lesson of Whitman versus American Trucking Associations, which was a review of the 1997 NACs by the Supreme Court, is that costs are not a permissible consideration in setting NACs. There is some disagreement about that. Um, I would note that Justice Breyer and his concurrence in American Trucking Associations did say that he thought costs were a permissible consideration. And I would also advise everyone here to keep their eyes on the Supreme Court over the next couple months. It's not a NAX case, but we are currently awaiting a decision from the Supreme Court in UARG and Michigan versus EPA, which is review of the mercury and air toxic standards. The question that the Supreme Court took up in that case is an interesting one. Uh, their EPA is required under Section 112N1A of the Clean Air Act to, to determine based on studies of the health effects. <laughs> that thing just likes to wake up, doesn't it? <laughs> EPA is required to do a study of the health effects of emissions of hazardous air pollutants from uh, fossil fuel fired power plants and then determine based on that study whether it is appropriate and necessary to regulate them. And the Supreme Court has taken up EPA's determination that it was appropriate and necessary to regulate cap emissions from power plants on the sole issue of whether consideration of whether it's appropriate requires consideration of costs. Now, that term, appropriate, looks quintessentially ambiguous. There's no apparent definition in the statute or elsewhere that suggests that it should or should not consider costs. And generally, the rule under Chevron uh, deference is that where a statute is ambiguous, you do defer to the agency's interpretation. So if the agency chooses to use costs in making that determination, it prevails. If it chooses not to use costs, it prevails as long as it can explain itself. We may be seeing somewhat of a sea shift at the Supreme Court. There was a lot of questioning from the bench during arguments two weeks ago that suggested that at least three, maybe four, possibly even five justices think that it is irrational to regulate without considering costs, no matter what the statute says. Depending on the breadth or narrowness of a decision, or which, obviously which way it goes, it's quite possible that the government will prevail in this 5-4. But if the case goes for the challengers to the mercury and air toxic standards, depending on the breadth of the court's decision, we might well see costs re-injected into rulemaking as a factor no matter what the statute says. If the decision comes down that <coughs> way, it could require as well a re-examination of the American Trucking Association's decision. So we'll have to wait and we'll have to see. Now, while costs can't be considered in setting the next, they are, as Henry said, a permissible consideration in implementation figure out the most cost-effective way to get to the goals that, that EPA has set in the next, that's fine. And in fact, that's what the states do in the SIP process. They figure out the most cost-effective way to get there. And they're permitted to do that. <coughs> now, let's turn briefly to Mississippi versus EPA. I've mentioned this case a couple of times over the last few days. It is a very <coughs> important case. As you may recall here, this is one where uh, KSAC had recommended prior to 2008 that EPA lower the ozone max from its current 84 parts per billion 
down to somewhere between 60 and 70 parts per billion. Notably, the same range the Case Act is recommending now. That recommendation hasn't changed in 10 years, although there is more evidence, says Case Act, for lowering it. EPA declined to follow Case Act's recommendation in 2008. They are permitted to do so under the statute. EPA is to give some credit to what CASAC recommends and follow it, or if they don't, they must explain their departure. And in that case, EPA did explain its reasons for departing from CASAC's recommendation, chose to set the NAAQS at 75 parts per billion, and that is where the NAAQS is today. Now, as, as I also said, there was a decision at the time uh, when President Obama came in to re-examine that conclusion that the NAC should have been set at 75 parts per billion. Uh, Lisa Jackson did testify before Congress and said in public many times, and I think we even at the Department of Justice filed briefs with the DC Circuit that said that that 75 part per billion standard was indefensible, legally indefensible. And we spent two years filing briefs with the D.C. Circuit saying that's indefensible, we're reconsidering. And then at the last minute in the run-up to the 2012 election, a decision was made at very high levels within the government that given the state of the economy and given how close the election looked and that uh, Obama would probably be hammered by his opponents if he tightened the necks in the midst of all this economic chaos, the decision was made to not finalize that NAAQS revision. It probably was going to have gone down to 70 parts per billion, but it was left at 75. And so the Department of Justice was put in the position of having to defend a 75 part per billion NAAQS that had been publicly denounced as legally defensible by the very people who were defending it. You would think in that instance that EPA would lose. That didn't happen. And I think there's an important point to be taken from that. The court found that based on the science at the time, it was reasonable for the administrator to depart from CASAC's recommendation and set it at 70 parts per billion. It was irrelevant that Lisa Jackson had characterized that standard as legally indefensible. The question is, was it legally defensible at the time it was promulgated? Given the wide latitude that the administrator has to exercise her judgment to determine what is a requisite standard that protects health with an adequate margin of safety, the DC Circuit had little choice but to uphold it. So really a very important lesson to take from this is that the administrator has, it's not unreviewable discretion. It is certainly not unreviewable discretion. If there is no basis for what the administrator does or she has not explained herself, she can be reversed and the standard can be overturned. But it is a high hurdle to do so. And that case really demonstrates how high it is. So message one from Mississippi, uh, EPA can depart from CASAC's recommendation anytime it wishes. It must explain its decision to do so. Message two, and the, the court explicitly considered this and said this, EPA is permitted to take a weight of evidence approach in setting the NACs. And it can use studies from one area to fill in holes or clarify ambiguities that are left in studies <coughs> from other areas. So even if you have imperfect studies or studies that you wish had been condu conducted a different way, EPA can try and correct for those things by extrapolating from other data and studies that they have. That's the weight of evidence approach in EPA's view and the court blessed that in Mississippi. <coughs> Finally, uh, there is this issue of deference and we keep coming back to that. The area where the agency gets the absolute highest deference, we have Chevron deference, which is deference to the agency's <coughs> interpretation of statutes, they get high deference there. We have what we call our deference, or Seminole Rock deference, which is the agency's interpretation of its own regulations, which is even higher, though that <coughs> doctrine is somewhat <coughs> under threat at the Supreme Court right now. 
Uh, and then finally, we have the agency's deference on matters of scientific or technical expertise, and that is the highest deference of all. The courts will not second guess the agency's evaluation of science and, tech and technical issues unless it is clear there is nothing to support what the agency did. Now, why do I give you all that? Because you need to know the ground rules. There is a lot here that works in EPA's favor when setting a NAAQS. So you have to figure out how do you overcome all of this if you want to persuade the administrator to go somewhere other than where CASAC has directed or where she is inclined to go. The toxicological and epidemiological information that you've provided over the last couple of days is fantastic information. I think it is a whole new way of looking at this that EPA may not have thought about before. And I really commend you all for having thought so hard about this and for submitting it to EPA. Recognize, though, that there are scientists, toxicologists, epidemiologists, and others who probably support what EPA is doing. And EPA is permitted to choose those over uh, yours. So you need to demonstrate to the administrator really why those others are wrong. You can't just say we disagree. You must really demonstrate the fallacy of the studies on which they are relying. Hard task. Can be done, but it's a hard task. Uh, we've had a tremendous amount of information pat, uh, shared over, really yesterday, about the costs. <coughs> the high cost of getting these marginal reductions in ozone levels nationwide and in the particular states. Not a salient factor in the setting of an axe, at least not now. Let's pay attention to what the Supreme Court does, and you are. Chuck is sort of smiling over here. We're, we're all waiting for this decision. <laughs> but John Morrell yesterday presented us something I think that was very, very interesting, which is the health health analysis. EPA looks at one aspect of what is an adverse impact on public health, and that is. How many additional deaths are we going to see? What additional morbidity are we going to see as a result of not lowering the NAX? It is not apparent that they have considered at all the health disbenefits that may attend a significant lowering of the NAX. Loss of income and changes in diet and stress loss of social services that come from reductions in state revenue that are attendant with those loss in jobs and so forth. That, I think there is a very credible argument, is a proper part of the health analysis. And the administrator is tasked with protecting public health with an adequate margin of safety. If the administrator has failed to consider an important aspect of the problem, then her decision is arbitrary and capricious. So EPA has to address that, I believe, before it can proceed to set the next. That's not to say that the administrator couldn't disagree with your cost estimates, how much economic impact will lowering the next have. But if there is a route into this that is likely to be effective with the courts, it is probably that. And with that, I will turn things back over to the next speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. Tom? <clears throat> well, I'm, uh, I'm Don Arbuckle, and I'm here because uh, with John Morrell, I uh, inhabited, uh, largely lived at, the office in uh, OMB that reviews all federal regulations, and that includes, of course, all EPA regulations. So I was part of that process from the office's creation in the beginning of uh, 1981 through seven terms to the uh, middle of George W. Bush's second term. And then I heard the siren call of the Texas prairies, and, <laughs> and here I am. So I'm going to continue the co contextual 
um, background uh, that w you've heard a little bit on, on the legal side in a, a broader sense that focuses more on the context within which um, science becomes policy. It's not a pretty, it's not a pretty process. Mm -hmm. and, and those of you who are um, scientists, you know, would, well, you might as well leave because it's really <laughs> not pretty. But in any case, so uh, first I, I want to uh, uh, come back to uh, something Roger said the first, uh, the first day, which was that uh, context is important, and indeed it is extremely important, um, as uh, particularly on the legal side, but there's a bigger kind of institutional people um, set of processes too. So first, uh, uh, I want to point out that the world that we in this room live in here, in this room, although the, the food is, is good, but even at home, um, the world we live in is not remotely like the world that the EPA administrator lives in, whoever that poor person is. Um, she, her world is dominated by uh, uncertainties and hysterical uh, emergencies that, that dwarf, at least on a human scale, what we've been talking about. And in the looking glass bubble world, smoke and mirrors that she lives in every hour of every day, um, she is being scrutinized, well actually it's attacked, by just about everybody. So who, who are some of those people that are after the administrator? Well, there's 535 members of Congress, uh, first of all. These are the elected officials that, that have the ultimate, dis, uh, the ultimate authority to decide what happens in the country. They have to drag the president along, but they can, they can do that if they, if they want to. And they can certainly drag the EPA administrator along if, if they want to, and sometimes they do, often, often uh, they don't. Um, uh, then another con uh, constituency are the, uh, for those of you that have worked on the Hill, the numberless 20-somethings that uh, run around the halls of the Senate and uh, House buildings uh, who staff the elected officials and who actually um, run the country and, and who, um, uh, who are, are filled with energy and enthusiasm. It's, it's good that they're 20-somethings that they're because they, they need a lot of energy. Um, but they do so with, um, with an arrogance that only the young can man manufacture and get away with. Another constituency is the president himself. So in, we have this weird system that where the president is, is not legally responsible for making the final decision, even though he's the only elected official in the executive branch. So Congress has given the authority to make this decision to one of the president's own subordinates, who the Congress helped appoint but the president, at least technically, can, can fire. It's just, it's a bizarre system. And yet here we are, still after 235 years. Another constituency is the White House staff, including OMB and OIRA, who are always pecking at agencies, <coughs> saying you should do this, you should do that, and whose, um, whose, whose members, uh, including John and I on occasion, have said to agencies, the president wants X, and he wants it now, meaning I want this, but I'm in the president's office. The court system is always kind of lurking in the background, sort of the administrator has to worry about what, what that court is, is going to do. In fact, a lot of what she has to worry about is meeting the arbitrary and capricious standard that, that uh, I'll mention. Um, she faces a rapacious press who needs a story. They're, except for a few people, they're not interested in the details. They're interested in sticking the details into a, uh, a bigger story. And that story they usually get from people who either believe that the EPA administrator is causing James Madison to be writhing in his grave, tearing out his hair <coughs> and bemoaning the death of his constitution, or people on, on the other side who believe that um, 
the administrator is selling the health of America's children and AARP subscribers to Beelzebub. Another constituency is the angry mob of, uh, of affected parties or parties that sort of want to be affected or parties that are paid to be affected or whatever, many of whom are predisposed not only to disagree with her, but to actually personally hate her. This, this, is, not a, this is not a nice debate that goes on up there. This is a highly passionate, just about everything except weaponry. Uh, I mean, real Texas weaponry is, <laughs> is fair game. Finally, in another odd twist, another constituency has to worry about is their own staff. Because the own staff, like John and I know as being career uh, public servants, we are, uh, were and they are loyal to the administration, but they have a different point of view. They know that the current people are going to leave and that a new president is going to come in, a new administrator, and so on and so forth. So in this world, um, the, uh, common sense, which uh, Roger mentioned, is hard to discern. It's very hard to discern. And so there's a reason that the average tenure of high-level uh, uh, admi administration decision makers is about 20 months. This is not a fun job. They, they think it is because they get a car that will drive them home. But, you know, so the car drives them home at 10 o'clock, picks them up at 6, and they go back to work. It's, uh, and they do that on Saturday and Sunday. It's not. Um, they get to go to the White House once in a while, but that's about it. So, um, two or three hours. <laughs> okay. All right. So a, a couple of points, uh, more points. First of all, uh, EPA, uh, we, have, we have had the luxury of taking this set of documents that EPA has put together and analyzing it, looking at it, poking holes in it, uh, uh, talking about alternate ways of, of doing things and so on and so forth. But as was mentioned, the EPA administrator doesn't have the luxury of saying the standard, you know, can be in a range from 60 to 80, right? The administrator has to draw a bright line and has to draw a bright line across every one of the uncertainties that we have talked about over the last three or four days. And as, we, as you, many of you have mentioned, this is not an easy thing to do, but she, she has to do that. And I, 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 you know, I think if, if we divided ourselves into two groups, locked one of ourselves in the room and said, come up with a, you know, the standard and an RIA and an everything kind of analysis and brought it back, the other half could legitimately find lots of things to criticize and argue. So that's part of the difficulty of moving science, which is generally happy, not happy with uncertainty, but uncertainties like, <clears throat> so what's new with uncertainty? The, the political, the policymaker can't have uncertainty, particularly a regulatory, um, a regulatory compliance, uh, a regulatory agency looking at, at compliance. So, um, so it sounds like, like it's all been a waste of time, right? I mean, all is lost. No, all is not lost. Um, we are not, uh, we are not do uh, doomed to um, a, a world where uh, science gets put off in a room where scientists can argue with, with each other. And, uh, you know, go the governor, we govern by, I don't know, tea leaves, palms, and chicken entrails. Um, in fact, we have much to be optimistic about. So another way of looking at what we have been talking about is how amazing it is that we have so much science to poke at, right? EPA has put together a, has interpreted, put together, misput together, you know, confounded, it's, uh, contradicted itself, I'm, I'm sure. We used to uh, constantly find 
that if you looked on page you know, 592 of the secondary appendix to the, uh, to the, to the uh, regulatory impact analysis, you would find statements uh, totally contradicting the direction that the agency went. It's a, it's a huge, uh, kind of ugly, you know, set of documents. But it is uh, loaded with enough science to have people of your caliber here talking about uh, the science and the economics and, and, and the law. Um, I wrote an article several years ago um, about my experience with analysis of all, all these kinds in the White House. And the title of it was The Role of Analysis on the 17 Most Political Acres on the Face of the Earth. That's the White House kind of complex. So the question that I asked was, in this political cauldron, why does the president care about analysis at all? Does he have time for this, all this science stuff and worrying about modes of action and stuff? Well, the answer is yes. He does. He does care about it. All the presidents that John and I worked with, all of their staffs, they cared a lot about it for a variety of reasons, one of which is they, they, they have to convince a court that it makes sense, but they also have to convince members of Congress, and ultimately they want to do um, the, the right thing by the, by the public. So uh, uh, finally, I want to um, uh, um, uh, try to answer this question, which is, to, to whom is this conference directed? Who is, our, who is the audience for what we've been talking about? And there's lots of audiences. So one is not the EPA administrator. I'm sorry, but it's too late. Right? The comment period, Claude, she is probably locked in a cage somewhere in, in EPA, down there in Federal Triangle, because she can't, uh, she can't be affected by any outside information that would lead a court to say, ex parte communication, you didn't give everybody a chance, back to the drawing board. There, the agencies have to be very careful, and they are very careful, about that very simple technical kind of purity, if you will, of the decision making by the dec decision maker. However, there are other open forums. One is uh, OIRA at OMB. OIRA reviews rules up to 90 days before they are published. Sometimes that 90 days is 24 hours. But um, I, don't, I would be surprised if the OIRA staff at OMB are not informally reviewing this rule right now and asking many of the same questions and probing uh, the way that uh, you all have done the past, uh, the past few days. Um, and if you ask for a, a if you want to go in and talk to OIRA, you can, you can go and talk to them. All you, really, all you have to do is call the administrator. If the rule is over there, they will generally say yes. You get to go in and, and, and present whatever you want to present. Um, they won't tell you anything about their own work, timelines. They won't tell you what's going, you know, wh what direction anything's going. They're very good at being, you know, that kind of semi-blank public servant look when <laughs> faced with, with the public. But they will be listening, and the documents that you present to them, uh, EPA will be there, and th the documents will go to EPA. So there is a way to get to EPA. Uh, another uh, audience is the White House and the President himself. I don't know, you know, could knock on the White House door, maybe the President's at home. Um, uh, the Vice President, he's a chatty guy, you might, you might be able to get in <laughs> and talk to him. Uh, you might, uh, generally the White House staff will, will, um, w will have been told, asked to, to stay away from something is, that's, his, uh, that's a regulatory decision making uh, effort like this, but uh, you might get you might get the uh, chairman of uh, CEQ, uh, in Council Environmental Quality, Council Economic Advisors, other White House offices. Not easy to get to, but if you can find out where their house is, you might be able to you know get them while they're walking from their car. Uh, the court system. This is going to the court. You know, this is going to court a nanosecond after uh, it gets effect issued or effective date. One, one or the other. So it, it is, uh, uh, so you can, you know, dust up your briefs because it's going, I mean, you know, your, your briefs, uh, going to court. Uh, con now Congress, Congress is another 
uh, huge, you know, it's the third, the third branch. It's the one that uh, thinks they run the world. Uh, the president thinks he runs the world. John and I thought we ran the world, but uh, the Congress people are the ones that are elected to actually do it. And um, they have already, when <coughs> EPA uh, published its proposal, there were, <coughs> you know, cries of, uh, you know, a, astonished outrage is generally the, you know, the, the public face that Congress people like to put on when something like this. So they're outraged on behalf of their constituents. And uh, there, there have been an, introduced several bills to, um, to, to kill. It's more like to, like, I'm sorry, um, to, to, to eviscerate this rule. I mean, and, and the people, all the people who did it. Uh, anyway, the bills. But Congress already has a tool uh, to do this called the Congressional Review Act. It was passed during the Newt Gingrich 104th Congress. It's a rule that creates uh, a, um, a, 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 a quick, quick legislative track that um, gives an up and up, yes or no to uh, to a federal rule. It's been used once with OSHA's ergonomic rule, another rule with a stack of you know a rule RIA four four feet tall. Um, Stuart Shapiro actually read the whole thing, and um, poor guy left to become a professor. Um, um, and uh, that is a, uh, a potential uh, congressional avenue. Uh, such a bill, were it, to, were it to go quickly through the Republican House and Senate, would have to be signed by the president. And um, they would want to either be sure that they could override a presidential veto, which is quite possible, or wait till the next election to, to try to do it uh, then although it would be better to do it sooner. So all is not lost. So I leave you with a, um, uh, the, the, my final word is it's not over. No matter what happens, no matter what is published, even if they go, even if they go to 50 uh, or if they go up to 90, it's, st it's not over when they publish this final rule. Um, and this, is, this does not mean that you shouldn't, we all shouldn't continue to do what we're, sort of what we do for a living, um, but it is, it is not over. So, um, so I guess, be, you know, be of good cheer. I, I have an aphorism uh, wh which my, uh, John and my colleague Art Frost, um, there were many, many unhappy days at OIRA as we, having raised the question, you had watched the rule go sailing through the way it had uh, originally been. And he, so he would say his doleful lament was, um, victory is defeat deferred. <laughs> so I would leave you with the converse, which is defeat is victory on vacation. <laughs> Thank you, Don. That's great. Paul? <laughs> Chris, thank you very much. And I want to take a, just a minute at the start to um, say, first of all, that I'm flattered to have been in the company of such distinguished economists and scientists and lawyers and policy analysts for uh, the past three days. Um, and I want to give credit to Mike and his colleagues at TCEQ. I have to say that I've been in this business since 1972. I'm not going to do the subtraction. I know what it is, but I'll let you do that. It's a long time. Uh, I've worked on ambient air quality standards, as I'll say in just a minute, for uh, a long part of that time. I've never seen a, a meeting at which scientists and policy analysts have gotten together to talk about standard setting. I've been in plenty of meetings where it's all scientists and I was the lone economist. I've been in plenty of meetings where it was all economists or policy analysts, but very few scientists. And I give a lot of credit to TCEQ for trying to bring these people together at the same time to do this. I, I think it's a great undertaking, and I think it's a shame that it doesn't happen more often. Uh, it's, it's been an opportunity, I hope, for each side to educate the other a little bit. I also want to say thanks to Michael, Jacqueline, Janelle, and their Terra colleagues for the terrific organizational job that they've done. They've fed, and in my case, overfed us, and uh, uh, made everything awfully easy, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, and then finally, I want to say a special thanks to the science um, experts who have been here. 
uh, and the economic experts who made presentations yesterday. Um, in a way, you've been here as resources for the people on this final panel, but I know that everybody in the room has learned from you, and um, so I, a special thanks to the, you guys for the contributions that um, you have made. Uh, a couple of disclaimers at the start. Um, first of all, uh, and this goes to Chris's point also about why have I been invited to participate, which I'm sure many of you have been wondering. Um, starting in 1972, I went to work at a place called Resources for the Future in Washington, a think tank that specializes in energy and environment. And it's a wonderful place. It's remarkably independent in a town in which it's pretty doggone hard to keep your independence. And, doing basically economic analyses of the costs and benefits of environmental and energy and other types of regulations. Uh, during that time, um, I actually spent three years doing epidemiology uh, sponsored by EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Um, maybe in the Q&A I can tell you how I got into that, but, but that does bear on um, my participation here, and some of you may see that as a conflict of interest. Uh, I should also point out, as my bio does, that I serve on the board of directors of a company called Empire District Electric. It's a small publicly traded New York Stock Exchange uh, electric utility in Missouri, and I chair the committee of the board that oversees our capital expenditures to keep us in compliance with environmental laws. Uh, next year, we'll wrap up $300 million of capital expenditures to get us into compliance with the mercury standards. Um, and in anticipation of reducing CO2 emissions, uh, the conversion of a couple of, closing down a couple of small coal units and a couple of relatively inefficient gas units and building a new combined cycle gas unit. Uh, finally, a more subtle conflict, uh, but one I want to mention, and that is I'm trained in economics. I've got a PhD in economics, uh, and for that reason I'm uh, congenitally unable to look at one side of anything. I just don't think you can make good public policy w without looking at both sides of the issue and without asking with respect to any policy proposal, whether it's an ozone NAX or something related to transportation or food and drug regulation, how much good is this going to do and how much harm will it do? What are the costs associated with this regulation? And trying to strike some kind of balance between the two. So I, I want to be upfront and open about that. That doesn't mean that I think everything has to be quantified. I don't believe that. I don't think that everything has to be expressed in dollar terms, although I think it's useful when you can express things in dollar terms to try to do that because it helps you cancel out both sides of the ledger. Um, but I want you to be aware of that bias. Now, for the last 10 years or so, befitting somebody of my increasingly advanced age, I've kept something taped to my computer monitor that I look at every day. And it's a saying that some of you may be familiar with. It goes, if your memories exceed your dreams, the end is near. Um, and so I don't want to reminisce and remember all the things in the past. I, I would like to look forward uh, and maybe even dream a little bit. Um, speaking of dreams, uh, my wife and I retired to Santa Barbara 10 months ago, and not long after we were there, I said to her, in your wildest dreams, did you ever think we'd live in such a nice place? And she kind of paused for a moment and collected herself and said, Paul, I love you to death, but in my wildest dreams, you're seldom a participant. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> talk about understanding your place in the world. I, so, on this theme, um, let's dream a little bit about what Section 109 of the Clean Air Act might look like if it were being written today. Um, but of course, laws are and ought to be reflections of the times. So let's engage in a little bit of what it was like then and what it's like now. So then, and the Clean Air Act was being written in 1969 in the early part of 1970, um, then we had just had in the summer of 1969 an air pollution inversion in Pittsburgh that was so bad that everybody who was out driving at noon had to turn their car headlights on and the city of Pittsburgh turned on their streetlights. 
Um, and it wasn't just Pittsburgh. I grew up in Detroit and in Milwaukee, Detroit, Chicago, Baltimore, Cleveland, Boston, in any U.S. industrial city at that time, while air quality was probably not quite as bad as current Beijing and other Chinese city levels or as bad as it is in Delhi in India, it wasn't all that much better. Today, well, we've had now 45 years of continuous improvements in air quality. Virtually every single air pollutant is not only better, but in most cases dramatically better than it was in 1970. And so Chinese air pollution problems, when I show pictures to my students, as I did until I retired 10 months ago, they just laughed. They thought, no, it can't really be like this. But it can, and it was like this in the United States, but it's not now. Then, low-hanging fruit was everywhere. You couldn't swing a cat by the tail without seeing a very, very low-cost opportunity to reduce emissions of lead, particulate, VOCs, carbon monoxide, etc. Tons and tons of relatively inexpensive opportunities to reduce. Now, we just heard yesterday uh, that we're talking about uh, NOx reductions that will cost $75,000 per ton, maybe as much as a quarter of a million dollars per ton under certain assumptions and in certain cases. So, the low-hanging fruit is largely gone. The middle-hanging fruit is largely gone. We're picking from the very tops of the trees now, okay? Then, uh, in 1970, we were roughly 25 years into what I think will be seen as the 50 or 60 best economic years in the country's history, the period between the end of World War II and about the year 2000, okay? Economic growth was in the range of 3 to 4 percent, averaged over that period of time. Um, today, well, gee, now we're coming off the worst economic experience since the Great Depression. Um, oh, and incidentally, during that, I said we were 25 years into the best 50 years that we'd had, we were just beginning to build the interstate highway system. We were investing in airports, libraries, we had begun in the United States to build a university system that today is the envy of the world uh, and investing in other infrastructure. And because of the Sputnik scare in the 1960s, the government stepped up research and development to unprecedented levels, which of course had immediate national defense implications, but the benef benefits of which spilled over in ways that have enriched our lives immeasurably, okay? Today, I said, we've come off a terrible economic calamity. Um, leading economic experts, Robert Gordon at Northwestern, Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard University, are saying, is saying that we're probably not, no, it's uncertain, it's like estimating health effects. We don't know for sure, but they think we're entering an era of much slower growth in the United States. Maybe the U.S. economy will grow at 1% or 2%. If you think the difference between 1% and 2% and 3 and 4% is small, you're crazy. It is a huge difference in the standards of living that we'll enjoy, that your kids and their kids will enjoy over the next um, three or four or five decades. <clears throat> and because economic circumstances have changed, our infrastructure is a mess in the United States. We're disinvesting in education at every level at the greatest rate in higher education. Very, very hard to see how in 30 years other countries will say of the U.S. system of higher education, you've got 20 or 30 really top universities and a bunch of mediocre ones. And the government and to some extent even the private sector, which has become so short-term focused, <coughs> is disinvesting in research and development. That's a way that things are different now. Then, not only was the country growing faster, but the benefits of that growth were much more widely shared. I grew up in a blue and white collar suburb of Detroit. My dad was an engineer and mid-level manager for Ford Motor Company. The people on either side of the house I grew up in were skilled tradesmen who worked for Ford and General Motors and Chrysler. My dad took delight in pointing out to me that in many years, 
millwrights and electricians made more than he did, principally because of the overtime that they had. But those people saved money and put their kids through college. They had a boat. They often had a small cottage in northern Michigan. My point is that not only was the country getting wealthier as a whole on average, but that, the benefits of that growth were extending to everybody. Come on, do I have to tell you what the situation looks like today? The average continues to go up, but a very large share of the gains go to those at the very top. In part because they're smart and hardworking, in part because the way technology has reshaped the world, it has implications for where jobs have gone, in part because those at the top can spend money on politics and the rules often favor them to some extent. That's part of the picture, it's not all of the picture. But things are very different. My point is that we probably wouldn't write the Clean Air Act or Section 9 of the Clean Air Act the same way today that we wrote it in 1969 and 1970. So how might we write it today? Well, I actually sat down and tried to scribble off what I thought the main part of Section 109 would look like. Remember, more or less in an accelerated version, it says, the administrator shall set national ambient air quality standards to provide an adequate margin of safety requisite to protect against adverse health effects, including health effects in sensitive populations, with no mention of costs. And as Tom pointed out, the Supreme Court has said, if Congress had intended for costs to be taken into account in establishing the standards themselves, they would have said that in the law. Nine to nothing verdict by the Supreme Court. Okay, the conservative court populated with, you could say, what, five justices appointed by Republicans, nine to nothing said, if costs are supposed to be taken into account, that's what Congress would have said. Well, what it, would it look like today? I think it might look something like the following. The administrator shall establish air quality standards uh, to protect critical ecosystems and public health probably not a distinction, including the health of those most vulnerable because of age, genetic predisposition, economic circumstances, or other factors. In doing so, the administrator shall explicitly take into account other factors, including one, the costs associated with reducing emissions, two, the natural background concentrations and or unique geographic or meteorological um, conditions, let's see, conditions in various regions. Three, the impacts on the types and amounts of energy the country uses, as well as the security of these energy supplies. And four, other factors deemed appropriate. That's a guess on my part. I'm often wrong, seldom uncertain. Maybe you have a, a, a better um, version of what it might look like today, but I think that's what it would look like today. It would say, of course we've got to take cost into account. We're not as rich as we thought we were in 1970 when, a wrote, when we wrote a law in the wake of horrible air pollution in many US cities that said set these standards to protect public health and we're not even going to mention costs in the, in the setting of the standards. In the implementation, yes, OK? So that's just one view, one person's view of what it might look like today. Well, what about the Clean Air Act that we have? OK, it doesn't say the things that I just said. But I'd argue that we make decisions today just about the same way we would, <coughs> excuse me, if the law read the way I described it. That is, I think we do make crude trade-offs between health effects, both uh, acute and chronic, related to both <coughs> mortality and morbidity. Um, and in fact, I think we should. I've made it clear. I think we ought to explicitly balance these things because decisions about air quality standards are every bit as political as decisions are to increase food stamps to this group by raising income taxes in this group or cutting health protections to this group so that we can reduce income tax burdens on that group, those are inherently political decisions 
and so too are decisions about setting environmental standards. And I actually think we make these trade-offs in the current law. How do we take cost into account even in setting the standards? Well, we've talked a lot about this over the last couple of days, but basically, I think if the decision to tighten the ozone standard from 0.75, I still think in parts per million, it's clear that the world has shifted to parts per billion, but if the decision to go from 0.75 parts per million or 75 parts per billion to six parts per billion is gonna cost the country an arm and a leg, then what the administrator does, and I would argue ought to do, is say, boy, the health evidence that suggests we ought to go to six, you know, there are an awful lot of uncertainties there, and they're too great to justify that step. As if there aren't just as many uncertainties at 0.75 or 75 parts per billion. Um, there are uncertainties about health studies supporting any level of a standard. And so I think what happens today is that, in essence, these trade-offs are made, and they're made via the administrator's expressed concerns about the uncertainties of health effects at various levels. And my nightmare, I've talked about my dreams, or I guess my wife's dreams, <laughs> in which I seldom show up. Um, um, my nightmare is that somebody does a health effect study, and it will happen one day, that shows at two parts per billion, there actually is an adverse health effect, and that the study will be extremely well done, and that it will be very hard for the administrator to say, gee, uh, I, I gotta find some fault with this because we'd have to close down the country if I set an ozone standard of two parts per billion. I think we've got a big problem on our hands then, and that's probably the, the point at which the whole house of cards collapses. Okay, finally, um, so what's wrong with this? I believe in balancing. I said if we would write the law today, we would probably say you have to explicitly take these other effects, including economic effects, into account. And now I've said, well, I think we actually do today, though covertly, um, why should we change the law? Well, first of all, I think it makes us do a lot of stupid things. Uh, one of which was, which was alluded to, I think, yesterday is that the EPA is required to do a benefit cost analysis for every single major regulatory action, a regulation that imposes more than $100 million per year on costs on the country. And it costs a lot of money to hire a consulting company or people to do the benefit cost analysis. Then it can't look at it until it's issued the final standard. Is this a great system or what? You have to spend money on something, but then don't look at it until the horse is out of the barn. I mean, this is ridiculous. No rational society would do this. There are other problems with it, in my view. I think it encourages disingenuousness on the part of public officials. It makes our EPA administrator say, no, I would never take cost into account, when we all know, and she or he knows, that costs are one of the factors that has dictated the selection of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. That's not the way to run a country. It, it puts people in an impossible and unfair position. And finally, and to me most importantly, I think it fosters cynicism about government and the law. To have a law that says you can't do this when everybody knows that we are going to do it and probably should, I think just further creates the impression that government and laws don't matter in this country, and I think that that's corrosive and harmful, and I think it undermines much more important things than air quality standard setting, environmental standard setting in general. Um, I think it goes way beyond that. And so I think if we basically know that we're making trade-offs and that we ought to, that that's the way our laws ought to be written. And with that, I'll stop. <coughs> Paul, thank you very much. All right, Chuck, you're up. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start with uh, a visual aid. Uh, three months before I graduated from law school in uh, 1981, To Breathe Clean Air was published. This was put out by the, uh, the National Commission on Air Quality. 
and it was, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it got me excited about federal <coughs> policy making, and so I went to Washington in 1981 and had the uh, uh, great pleasure of, uh, ten years later, working for uh, the people you know in the uh, that really ran the world, John, <laughs> the uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, where staff. The, 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 uh, as staff, that's right, as staff, one of the exuberant, youthful, uh, professional staff counseled the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, during the uh, really <laughs> seminal uh, Clean Air Act amendments of, of 1990. And, uh, you know, working with uh, uh, Chairman Dingell and, and uh, Norm Lent, Ed Madigan, and, and many others, uh, the substantive arm of the uh, Congress where uh, laws are shaped, if it's, people talk about jurisdiction and reach, uh, in the chairman's con conference room, there was a picture taken from one of the Apollo uh, um, orbiting satellites of the Earth from afar, and that was Chairman Dingell's jurisdiction. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, and we, uh, the, so I got excited about To Breathe Clean Air. I went back and read por portions of it, including uh, dissenting and concurring opinions back then. Uh, and, and, and just, you know, last week, and it's uh, remarkable, the uh, uh, commentary, the need for uh, improved science, the, the need for uh, reducing uncertainty, the need for calculating benefits, the uh, holy grail of not considering costs uh, in the selection of uh, the... Um, uh, NAX, the, uh, uh, as articulated by several of the participants, uh, the, uh, because the science would be firm and because implementation would be taking into account costs. That was a predicate for the view that uh, you do not need to infuse um, costs into the standard setting process. So, you know, in the 90 amendments, we did an awful lot of things, and I mentioned the other day that I really thought the intractable issues involving ozone is what led. In 1988, there was a famous vote uh, to extend the ozone deadlines to, because states were very concerned uh, about um, uh, the sanctions that uh, could flow, and, uh, and it was uh, the Murphy-Conti vote. Uh, those were the two proponents of the legislation, and uh, you know, Chairman Dingell was was uh, indicated that don't worry, the floor uh, is solid. You got the vote. Uh, ozone's going to be deadlines are going to be extended, and vote went the other way, uh, and uh, and that had a that had a number of um, implications. It, it really meant the states and. And uh, I, I want to emphasize that the states had an important role in moving the Clean Air Act forward in 1990, their concerns about uh, ozone. It also had great implications over my negotiating process in the following, uh, you know, two years later as to how one would approach negotiating legislation if, in fact, you know, who actually controls the votes on the, uh, the House floor. Um, so my background, from there, for the last next 25 years after I left the Hill and dealt with the uh, Clean Air Act extensively, I've, I've really walked the act from the Capitol Dome to the shop floor, all manner of uh, almost every major rule uh, and litigation on those rules. And so I was uh, delighted when, uh, when I was approached to be on this, this panel with such other um, you know, luminaries in uh, policy uh, thought you know, thought leaders, and uh, I uh, was also delighted to to uh, come to Texas. I'm always interested in coming to Texas. My uh, dad has a ranch, uh, a ranchette, 400 acres, uh, <laughs> for you know between here and, and Austin and in, in Houston, and uh, uh, I uh, recently you know opened up a Austin office and a Houston office, and so it's it's good to get here. There's reason we opened up offices. Uh, in, in these two cities because of uh, the economic growth uh, and uh, uh, permitting, that's my business, uh, permitting needs in, uh, in Texas. So lots of reasons for me to, to want to join the, uh, the group here. I want to uh, uh, first,
before I launch into uh, trying to put my perspective on what, I, what I've heard for the last two days, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm looking at uh, what Tom did as far as uh, the running rules for the courts uh, and what's constraining the administrator uh, today. That was great. Uh, Don, you know, the running rules and pressures and constituents of, uh, of, of, of the, uh, that, that bear on that decision making process. Uh, there's a book in town called the uh, Plum Book for Great Jobs in Washington. Um, the EPA administrator, um, uh, her job is actually listed in something called the Prune Book. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a reason for that. Uh, and, uh, and then, Paul, you know, you, you laid out, you know, how uh, ideas on how the law should change, but also got into areas I I'm going to get into, which is, okay, that's great to think about. Um, and and uh, we, we can talk more about that. Uh, but today, looking at the science, operating under the, uh, the, the, uh, the current uh, running rules that, uh, that Tom laid out and, and Don laid out, you know, what, uh, what's possible? Uh, and I am a strong believer in uh, don't give up. I think one of my, my uh, you know, everybody has their own personal running rules, and uh, one of mine is everything can be fixed. Almost everything can be fixed. And uh, I'm a believer that the information developed here today uh, and uh, over the last uh, couple days is, can be very useful to the process. Uh, the, uh, uh, thank you, Mike, for putting this together. This is, it's really uh, remarkable. I've, I've been at this a long time and, and I haven't, as others have mentioned, I haven't uh, been involved in something where it's been so tremendously interactive, uh, you know, when, in, uh, the um, uh, science, policy, uh, economic, uh, you know, discussion, and it's really been uh, illuminating. The uh, I believe the uh, a special call out to the science, you know, panel. I think it's all been very, you know, uh, objective uh, and and sincere dialogue. Uh, it's new information, reanalysis of existing information. Uh, willing to deal, because we posed, we tried to pose, you know, the alternative perspectives to them and so that we could get their reaction to it. Uh, that's all been uh, really, really helpful. Uh, the uh, uh, five years ago, I had a conversation with the person at EPA who really was managing all the NAAQS reviews, SO2, PM, ozone. And I, I, I just posed the question, you know, what are, what's the principal basis for the Goldilocks test that you've all heard so much about, you know, neither, you know, as expressed in the Whitman case? You know, what, how do you decide, you know, too soft, too hard, just right? You know, what, what, how are you going to do the line drawing? Uh, and, and after some thrashing about, I got the response, well, you know, Chuck, Setting the NACs is qu the quintessential exercise of the agency's discretion. And I think that, that that summed it up. There weren't criteria. There wasn't really a desire to lay out clear criteria so that you could replicate decisions in, in with, with what's before you. It's, you know, uh, an admission, perhaps, that it's reverse engineering a s uh, decision made up of a soup of, you know, politics and science and a whole lot of other factors. And, um, but that left me pretty dissatisfied. Uh, and and uh, it, that it may be the reality. Decision to go to 65 could well be supported. Is it really reverse engineering in order then to build a mountain of information that justifies uh, the decision? 65 could be supported. 70, retaining the current standard. Yes, retaining the current standard could be supported. Uh, Tom went through. Don't have to, you know, follow and, and, and the, the KSAC recommendation. There has to be reasons for not pursuing it, uh, but uh, the, uh, 
So what is, what is it that uh, should inform the decision? If in fact all of them probably can be upheld, you could probably reach a point where they wouldn't be upheld. You know, the decision would be, would be, um, and, and, and the, the, the court would pick at the rationale uh, as to whether it was, there was a rational basis or ration, you know, reasoned explanation. Uh, there may be a process flaw that the court would latch on to. So what you have is, uh, in, in essence, uh, the decision-making process today, you know, is, is, is probably best viewed as a riddle wrapped in a mystery, you know, um, uh, inside an enigma. I mean, I think, and, and, but I want to tease that out uh, because I think we can under the current construct. Um, and, and to do so, you got to focus on un uncertainty and uncertainty. And it's the uncertain, the certainty of the science regarding the decision-making process and the certainty of the benefits. Um, and the roadmap with speed bumps along the way for how you do this is really laid out in Justice Breyer's concurrence uh, in, the, uh, in the Whitman case. I mean, he, uh, he, he very specifically noted many things that, that the administrator can consider should, must consider today. The, um, uh, Breyer noted, we're not going to eliminate every health risk, you know, at a, every e economic cost. Um, uh, not going to bring about the ruin of industry uh, in, in, in America because the comparative <laughs> risk can be taken into account. The certainty of the science can be taken into account. The, uh, you know, that it is not requisite to protect public health if you're creating more harm than good. It's plainly stated in Breyer's opinion. That proposition, as in, that feeds back to uh, uh, John Morrell's points uh, you know, that we heard yesterday. So there were, there were several speed bumps along the way in the Breyer opinion that I think um, we can pull um, um, and, and, and apply this to what we've heard. I think, uh, the getting a little more granular on, um, on, on some of the, the great discussion we've had over the last two days. Um, you know, Tim, Tim first with respect to, to secondary standard. You know, his slide 25, suggesting that benefit to get to the current standard, but virtually no benefit, no benefit in going below the current standard under how he was analyzing things. That was, that was very illuminating. Dr. Lang's discussion of all of the, uh, the, the, the clinical work, and uh, in particular then, you know, the, the reliance on a couple of studies. Nobody on the panel, nobody on the panel, <coughs> in, um, uh, in, and Dr. Uh, Utel made this very clear with respect, every, you know, people recognize ozone it, um, is uh, uh, an irritant and causes inflammation. Uh, and, uh, but what the studies all are focused on, it, it appears, uh, and the new studies, uh, you know, that, that exist, you know, is a, um, a short-term reversible, you know, decrement reduction. And the, uh, the analysis, reanalysis done by Dr. Lang sh showing uh, on her slides 14 and 15, you know, it really, um, uh, the lines were all on top of one another uh, with respect to the standard. That's remarkable. Um, and all very, um, very much below the, um, the, the horizontal lines uh, indicating the, um, the, 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 um, the signals for seeing an effect. So that, that was quite useful. And then um, Dr. Um, uh, Goodman's um, entire presentation dealing with how one evaluates the uh, quality of the study and presenting a, uh, a, you know, that, its own roadmap and uh, uh, to uh, uh, better getting at the certainty of the science and, uh, and uh, the, 
identification and certainty of uh, recognized benef of perceived benefits. Uh, that, um, you know, and, and the table she had, uh, I guess, I can't, I, I think it was slide five, um, with, the, uh, um, with, with the shifts that we see in the two, you know, from the 2008 to, to, to 2015, the current review, were interesting to me because, um, as Tom alluded to, um, you know, the, the way the act's structured, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, in setting a new NACS, it's requisite to protect public health. And you gotta do it in a certain time frame, once certain things have happened under 108 with criteria pollutants and everything else, criteria documents. Uh, review process is different. Uh, the review process, you know, has, uh, uh, it, there, it's um, mandatory with respect to timing, very important to note. Um, and uh, that means a decision uh, is, some decision is mandatory. Um, but the, there is uh, the, 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 the good way to view it, however, is th that there is discretion as to the determination and timing of a revision. A, to the standard, when to actually revise the standard. That rests within the administrator's discretion. A determination has to be made and a review has to be made. That's clear. In addition, and just apart, uh, because I really want to focus on the world it is today, but we do have uh, the, um, um, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly litigating words I wrote 25 years ago, and one of those words was 112N uh, with respect to appropriate. Uh, and, uh, and, and now, and, and Tom noted the Matt's case uh, and how that could be, could bring costs into appropriate. And that same word is in the, uh, you know, uh, 109 uh, directive with respect to uh, review uh, and, and, and directive on how to review. Uh, that uh, and so it is something to watch, but I believe you know the, um, the again just continuing on with how we analyze under today um, the the looking at Breyer's comments because uh, I believe again providing a way to avoid unreasonable results in the sense that. Uh, proceeding with regulation where there is no measurable benefit, where there is, and, 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 and how do you do that? Um, by focusing on the uncertainty, as, as the standard gets lower, I believe the construct should be that the certainty of the scientific information needs to be firmer as you're lowering the standard in the face of greater uncertainty on the benefit side. Thinking back to Toby's presentation yesterday, I think uh, in the sense of the three-legged stool, uh, where does that fit uh, in the, you know, sound science confined by the statute with a dose of common sense? Uh, is, is, is my construct the common sense or is it part of the statute? I think part of the statute is indicated by what Breyer was talking about. Uh, and, and I think it's a directive. I think, I think it's really the administrator needs to apply that over, <coughs> overview as the standard is. And, and frankly, you, one could make the case, probably unsuccessfully, on how it would ever be, and Tom would probably, assuredly agree, probably, but you could make the case it'd be arbitrary and capricious not to use a construct like that and apply uh, a, a greater lens of uh, 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 requirement of uh, scientific, the need for scientific certainty on the studies as the uh, um, uncertainty and, and size of the, uh, um, um, the benefits, uh, uh, you know, diminish or the, the uncertainty regarding the benefits is increasing. I just, I, so that's, I was really thinking about how we 
in the context today, uh, if, uh, yeah, if, if I was having to grapple with this decision, and I think the comments several made that uh, the decision obviously, it's don't look at what's behind the curtain. I think it is, everybody knows it's a significant decision. You don't produce two feet of material and not know it's a significant decision that has significant impact. Of course, that is, there's an awareness by the administrator of that. And uh, um, um, the, uh, the, the issue is in articulating the reasons for the decision, you know, how, do you, how do you express that in, the, uh, in, in your thought process, in deci decision making? Uh, and, and I think the, the road is through uh, certainty and uncertainty. And, and I think the, the levers that have been um, laid out with respect to the, uh, uh, the chamber studies, you know, the administrator on the EPI studies, the administrator herself noted less weight being given to the EPI studies. Uh, the focus is on the, the clinical, uh, but the, the commentary about the lack of a systematic uh, approach to analyzing the various uncertainties and the quality of the information, the, uh, the picking and choosing, um, up, up, uh, that's what we, we heard that side. Obviously, you read through the preamble of the proposed rule and you read through the decision documents of KSAC as opposed to some of the individual write-ups by the individual members which present uh, at times you know different different <coughs> perspectives but the decision document the consensus document um, the administrators um, faced uh, with with a decision I don't envy at all um, truly because the administrators being presented with the um, articulation of the evidence as if it is um, very certain, uh, the benefits are very certain, uh, there is some generalized discussion of, of uncertainties, but it's, it's uh, marginalized. And many of the thoughts we've heard over the last two days are not uh, explicated in the, uh, in the, in, by, by KSAC or by the uh, um, um, in, you know, throughout the preamble. So the administrator then has the uh, world of constituents Don laid out in all the pressures, uh, the, uh, um, the, the uh, constraints of the statute that, that Tom laid out, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, plus the, uh, the, the need to, to move forward with, with a determination. I believe that the, in, in light of uh, the information presented, and I just want to talk a little bit about don't give up. Um, people write comments all the time, and the comment period closes all the time. You, you, uh, that happens. Uh, that's the record of review for the court. Okay. Um, information presented uh, the last two days is in the document. People talk to, um, talk to EPA staff and OMB staff about their comments all the time. That's what people do in DC. They go in and talk and sometimes it becomes very interactive and, uh, and enjoyable uh, because you get feedback, you get questions and, and um, other times it's a presentation uh, with, um, um, at, you know, with, without much uh, feedback. But you can go in after the comment period and explain your comments to EPA. Uh, and, um, um, you know, that's, um, and then of course you can go in and talk to the OMB staff and EPA will be there. So the, the conversation about certainty is, is no doubt going on, um, you know, today uh, on the comments that were recently filed. And they're going to continue through to the uh, um, near near the near the end when the final uh, uh, um, document needs to be prepared. 
the comment about timing is important because everything backs off a due date. Uh, you know, those in the agency know that's when it's going to be signed. You back it out. Uh, so at some point, the door truly closes toward any interaction because it's been moving up the chain for, uh, you know, management review and, uh, and final sign-off. Uh, uh, but right now, the, the, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a free-for-all that should be um, it, it, um, pursued with respect to the, uh, the information. Uh, the, the, I think, I think the, the, the level of information that we've got over the last two days is uh, um, significant, and I'm glad to see that it's in the record. And, uh, uh, and I think it'll continue the conversation, however, uh, even past, uh, you know, the, the final decision. Um, you know, I'm under uh, no illusion that, th you know, given all the forces that we've seen uh, and the strong desire uh, uh, to, uh, uh, in, in, an opinion expressed already in the proposal, to see a, uh, to see a tightening. But I think uh, it, it's, uh, I'm going to trot out one more visual aid that may be uh, helpful to the next level, next step. This was 1981. This was 1991. And this is called Rethinking the Ozone Problem in Urban and Regional Air Pollution. And it was a National Academy report. Uh, and it came out, started just before the Clean Air Act of 1990 with a charge, uh, and, and then it continued through after passage. And uh, uh, so the, you know, what it, there may be benefit in, uh, in, in reconstituting a, uh, um, an NRC report, uh, the um, study. And the question is, to what end? You know, what, what are, are, you know is it just going to be a debate over uh, a, a rehash of the debate uh, between certainty uh, of the science, or, or is it going to uh, move in a new direction? I think I think it it should uh, pick up on uh, some of Dr. Goodman's comments about evaluating the level of information and also looking at uh, maybe Paul's uh, great fear. You know, what are the studies that that could should have been done, could be done to. Um, um, better explain uh, effect, um, size of effect, what the signal is, uh, and uh, because at the end of the day, uh, need to get a better handle on whether the regulation, the tightening being considered, results in a, results in a benefit. And uh, um, is it worth it? I am, a, I am a, um, a strong believer in the view that uh, we don't want to create cynicism in our law. And I see it over and over again in the implementation world of the Clean Air Act, where there's duplicative regulation at times, uh, there's um, people watching people watching people in order to ensure certain things may be done, the violations are over record keeping, not over meaning, you know, me, me, emission um, excursions. And uh, it leads, it's very important for the folks implementing the law on the ground to have a belief that it makes sense. Uh, and, um, and I think that uh, this decision uh, could be the trigger for a review of the Clean Air Act. For 25 years, I've had clients come to me, others come to me. Uh, you know, uh, um, I, I work with all stakeholders negotiating things. People say, well, let's work out a change of the Clean Air Act. And it's always kind of, be careful what you ask for. You don't control that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the, you know, I, 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 you know, do no harm. <laughs> you know, maybe, uh, are you sure that uh, that's where you want to go? Many people think climate change may be the ultimate trigger for seeing the act revised. I'm not so sure. 1990, ozone. 
That was the trigger. You you put out you put out a a standard that is um, uh, highly problematic, is viewed as uh, um, um, based on soft science, not sound science. Uh, if that if if that is a perception that is. Uh, um, received by the public generally, uh, huge, huge uh, economic consequences. Uh, that is the sort of decision that can lead to the next round of the Clean Air Act being revised. So uh, I think I'll stop there, and uh, we can engage at a round table, perhaps. Very good. I, I thank all four speakers for, for really very thoughtful comments, and uh, I'll open it up to a quick word on our schedule this morning. Uh, the plan is to have conversation among the panelists until we break at 10.15. When we come back at 10.45, we'll open it up to questions, and uh, with that, I invite anyone to uh, comment. If I might lead off. Um, Again, I think all of this has been tremendously useful. I, I love the insight from each of you on this. Um, I'm going to take things back to the law for a second and then talk about approaches in light of the law. So I'm going to go back even further than we've gone before to lead industry associations way back at the inception of this. What is that, 1980 or thereabouts? Yep. I want you to listen to this because it's very pertinent to what we've been talking about for the last couple of days. And it's going to sound ominous, but it's not. Here we go. The administrator's conclusions were not unchallenged. Both lead industry association and the administrator are able to point to an impressive array of experts supporting each of their respective positions. Mm -hmm. However, disagreement among the experts is inevitable when the issues in involved are at the very frontiers of scientific knowledge. And such disagreement does not preclude us from finding that the administrator's decisions are adequately supported by the evidence in the record. It may be that LIA expects this court to conclude that LIA's experts are right and that the experts whose testimony supports the administrator are wrong. If so, LIA has seriously misconceived our role as a reviewing court. It is not our function to resolve disagreements among the experts or to judge the merits of competing expert views. Our task is the limited one of ascertaining that the choices made by the administrator were reasonable and supported by the record that the evidence in the record may also support other conclusions, even those that are inconsistent with the administrators, does not prevent us from, from concluding that his decisions were rational and supported by the record. Now, I don't care if you are American Petroleum Institute or if you're EDF. It suggests that you don't have a whole lot of control over the process once things are in the hand of, of the courts. That's probably true, and really, unless you can really demonstrate conclusively that the administrator's decisions were sort of out of the bounds of reason, as Chuck suggested. And there are instances where the administrator is out of the bounds of reason. What that means is that your real avenue for success, and again, I don't care if you're API or EDF, your real avenue for success is convincing the administrator on these axes that were discussed, certainty of the science, certainty of the health benefit. And the two are interrelated as has been suggested by the panelists this morning. As you get to more and more uncertain science, you would expect the health benefits from whatever you're attempting to do to be great. Because else it's hard to justify what you're, you're proposing to do. You're, you're proposing to spend a lot of money and have a lot of effect on the economy. Now, I know we're not allowed to consider costs, but without a lot of effect. And you're doing it based on science that is highly uncertain. So if you were to ask me, I would, I would want to go to the administrator and say, look, the science here is hotly in dispute. The studies are not well conducted. We don't really know what's going on here. We might have some ideas, but we're not sure. 
The health benefits, on the other hand, we're looking at, yes, we're, we absolutely have a duty to protect subpopulations from the effects here. But we are, we have to look at another aspect of the problem, which is how much of an impact will this have on the health of others, of the population generally? That is where, as Paul said earlier, costs sort of come into this debate covertly, implicitly. You'll note that the administrator does not automatically set the standard at the very lowest end of the CASAC recommended range. CASAC has recommended here going down to 60. I hear very little discussion from anybody that EPA wants to go as far as 60. Why is that? It's probably because she's thinking about, oh my god, this is going to be incredibly costly. She can't say that, but she's thinking that. And the benefits that you're going to get by going down that far cannot be justified for the costs that are going to be incurred. And this is where I think John Morales discussion yesterday is so important. How can the administrator take those things into account? It's in terms of the health disbenefits that may be implicated because of the costs involved. So if you are API, you will probably want to focus on the uncertainties in the science in contrast to the massive health disbenefits that could result from loss of employment, loss of state revenues, increased stress, changes in diet, loss of health insurance. If you are EDF, you'll want to take the opposite tack. You know, you'll want to focus on supporting EPA's view that those costs are actually much lower than have been estimated by some and that the health science is actually fairly solid. I'm not going to give you an answer to which way this debate should come out. There are two sides to this thing. But there is a role for everyone in this process and for assessment of uncertainties of, of science and health benefits on both sides. And that informs the administrator's decision. Just to just uh, jump on uh, Tom's uh, comment, uh, this is one of those uh, speed bumps I noted in, uh, in Breyer's opinion. The statute also permits the administrator to take account of, of comparative health risks. That is to say, she may consider whether a proposed rule promotes safety overall. A rule likely to cause more harm to health than it prevents is not a rule that is requisite to protect public health. For example, as the Court of Appeals held, and the parties do not contest, the administrator has the authority to determine what, to what extent possible health risks stemming from reductions in tropospheric ozone should be taken into account in setting the ambient air quality for ozone. So that was the example given. It was not part of what to the, went up to the Supreme Court for review. It was, so it remains the decision of the D.C. Circuit. It's cited in, Bri in Breyer's concurrence because it wasn't contested. So the vitality of, of looking at health health and at disbenefits mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is, 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 exists today. Mm -hmm. So how do you get that information to somebody that can get to the administrator between now and, <clears throat> I don't know, Thanksgiving, whenever the kind of printing presses have to start to roll. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, answer. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it gets to, you know, the old, the old joke, you know, uh, you know, where you uh, are asking a physicist and an economist and, uh, um, and, and, and a scientist, what's one plus one, you know, and two of them give you elaborate proofs and, oh, and the lawyer, and then the <laughs> lawyer, and then, and then the lawyer's answer is, well, what do you want it to be? You know, what, you know, it, it ultimately, we talked about reverse engineering here, I mean, ultimately, this matters if she is so inclined yes. to defer. And there's, there's a credible case to be made for deferral, as evidenced by the science here, uh, you know, that I create more certainty, look at the signal, uh, it, um, uh, dig in on the benefits, 
Uh, what, what about the line that we all spent an hour and a half talking about, you know, with respect to the cities? What does that mean? Are, how sure are we that a national standard is being set, a national uniform standard is being set, you know, in light of certain information that's actually going to result in benefits nationwide? How certain are we of that? There's a credible case to be made to say, you know, not, not yet. Not yet. I'm, I'm, I, I, it needs to be looked at more. There's, can the case be made and probably upheld to do go the other way? Yes. But what is so? So it's what does the, <laughs> it's almost starting at the beginning. If if there's receptivity uh, to the view of deferral, like there was for any number of reasons on the reconsideration. Uh, where it was absolutely going to reconsider, absolutely going to change. Well, not so fast. Maybe not. Uh, if there's receptivity, there is uh, uh, plenty in the record today uh, to uh, and, and 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 but could be teased out, can be promoted very specifically. This piece of it, um, you know, could be helpful. Yeah, and I I will just concur with with what Chuck just said. Um, the health health issue is raised in comments that were filed with the agency, certainly by the National Mining Association. I know because I helped write those. Uh, the science information that we've been discussing the last two days, I understand, has been submitted to the agency already during the comment period. As Chuck said, discussion doesn't stop because the comment period has closed. In fact, discussion really starts now. What did we mean in our comments? What are you going to do in response to our comments? There are opportunities now for all concerned parties to go before the agency and explain the implications of the comments and the data submitted. There are opportunities to go to OIRA and explain the economics of this and why those should inform the decision making towards one direction or the other. So the information is all there for the administrator, the, the matter now is to point it out and suggest where that should lead you. If I could say one thing, and this is pure speculation on my part, I want to be very clear about that. Um, I would be surprised if someone who is associated with or will become associated with Hillary Clinton's campaign to get the Democratic nomination for president hasn't made clear her views on how she would like to see the ozone standard come out. Um, because if EPA said this standard shall be six parts per billion, that will become the standard that she'll have to defend uh, in the campaign. And so people should understand. I, I said these decisions are political and they should be. Um, and there are, you know, 75 Republican presidential aspirates, <laughs> about 30 from Texas apparently, uh, <laughs> who would like nothing more than to see the administrator of EPA set the standard at six parts per billion, so. Yes, and there's also a president who is interested in a, a legacy, and it's not clear that he wants, would want this rule to be the carrier of that legacy. He might be wanting to sort of, being willing to downplay this in order to move, put more energy into climate change or use whatever <coughs> small amount of political capital he may have squirreled away somewhere <laughs> over the last few years. Well, let me tell you, there are a lot of dynamics at, at play here. I, I think this has been, a, for me anyway, a very interesting session. Like, I'll take a couple minutes to uh, make a few observations about both the, both the session and, and the meeting. Uh, as a, an engineer among economists and attorneys, I, I'm fascinated by uh, the, the struggles the technical people have looking for uh, models to explain what's going on. And I don't think we have a descriptive model of how EPA makes deci decisions. And the prescriptive model we have, namely that th uh, they're not allowed to consider cost, uh, is apparently uh, uh, not true. That is, uh, everybody was wide awake in yesterday afternoon's session on cost, and we, we heard that uh, 
EDF has posted a critique of the NERA analysis on their website. And it seems to me that we wouldn't have that critique or the NERA analysis if cost didn't matter. So we all know it does, uh, in spite of the law. Uh, we also have, I think, uh, more or less agreement between uh, EPA's uh, decision document and the health science presenters that the, the clinical trials are the more compelling and more informative science on the health effects than the epidemiology. And yet everybody stayed awake and asked lots of questions in the epidemiology session because uh, mortality is a lot more compelling and salient uh, than uh, a temporary effect in young, healthy, exercising individuals uh, who recover and live to tell about it. So it's a very complicated, multi-component decision that none of us really understands very well, uh, which, which, which is what makes it interesting. So with that, we'll take a half-hour break and okay. come back and let Chuck tell you why... Uh, why you should come back. Why yeah, you should come yeah, back. Yeah, hey, one, one, just one point. The, uh, why, why the afternoon yesterday mattered. Look at the agency's presentation of, of its story in its proposal. Completely unabashed presentation of the benefits of fine particulates. Uh, and, uh, and, and from the MATS rule generally. And, and, and a clear statement that doesn't matter. Can't take it into account in the standard setting. Well, the flip side, you know, is, uh, applies as well then. If you're telling the story about this rule and whether it matters, you know, and, and whether there's going to be an impact, it's certainly fair game to lay out the, uh, in, in, you know, the, the costs because the agency's doing it on the, on the other side with respect, you know, to the benefits. And I just want to point that out. We'll get